Oh, well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name's Dominic, Dominic Frisby, and um, this talk is called The Future of Work, Tax and Money. Work, Tax and Money. There's a lot to get through. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the author of this book, Bitcoin, The, the Future of Money, um, which uh, Richard Branson described as a great read. How about that? Except it's not clear to me that he actually read it. Um, <laughs> And it was the first book on Bitcoin published uh, by a sort of recognised author back in 2014. And um, it remains the best book on Bitcoin, um, according to my mother. And um, no, actually, according to Amazon, it's like the top ranked uh, book on Bitcoin. But in the UK, because due to the proliferation of no coiners in the publishing industry, uh, it never got an international release, so it was never sort of broadly read um, beyond the shores of this once great nation. But nevertheless, um, uh, it's the top-ranked Bitcoin book on Amazon.co.uk, and if I, I'm going to have that inscribed on my uh, gravestone. Um, and as well as being a writer, ladies and gentlemen, I've recently become a director of this company, Cypherpunk Holdings, which we um, have set up to invest in privacy technologies. And the reason we've set this company is up is that I'm convinced that the next great, the narrative which drives the next great bull market in technology is going to be privacy. And uh, we're listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol of HODL. Um, so that's me. Now, I get invited to go on a lot of um, TV programmes and radio shows to talk about Bitcoin. And inevitably, uh, on the show, there'll be the presenter who doesn't get it. There'll be some economist who doesn't get it. There'll be some journalist who doesn't get it. And they'll always go, it's tulips. They'll dismiss it as tulips. And what they don't realise, the tulip bubble in Holland took place in 1637. And here we are, 379 years later, and Holland remains the global centre of the tulip industry. Tulips have bought Holland hundreds of years of prosperity, trade and commerce. We need bubbles. Bubbles are essential to the development of any new technology. Without the dot-com bubble, the cables wouldn't have got laid. It accelerated all the investment that we needed to, to, to adopt the internet. The in tech stocks wouldn't be, we wouldn't be where we are today in technology had we not had that bubble in 2000. There's always a bubble that accompanies a new technology. Railways, all the railway lines were built uh, on the back of the railway mania of the 19th century and the stations were built. Bubbles are essential. So next time somebody dismisses Bitcoin as a bubble, forgive them, for they know not what they say. And it's important to def define what a bubble is. What is the definition of a bubble? A bubble is a bull market in which you don't have a position. So where are we in this great cycle of Bitcoin, this great new technology? There's a research company in the States, Gartner, some of you may be familiar, and they've devised this cycle which they call the hype cycle, which defines the journey that a new technology goes through from conception through to mainstream adoption. And here we have it here. There are sort of five phases, the innovation trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. And for those of you that look at the Bitcoin chart, you'll think that chart is very familiar. Um, I'm going to show this next chart which defines the various phases of the cycle. And remember, this is just an idealised academic cycle. Nothing follows these cycles precisely. But they're very useful as a tool to gauge where we are in um, Bitcoin's evolution. So here's the next chart with some more detailed things that happen in each phase of the cycle. So you have the technology trigger, the innovation trigger. That's when this new technology is conceived. The prototype models are built. Some early R&D takes place. Some early investment goes on. There are some sophisticated early adopters. And gradually, 
the media get wind of it and there's a bit of mass media hype and you have the peak of inflated expectations. And then people start to realise reality sets in. People start to realise that actually we've got a long way to go before this technology gets mainstream adoption. There's a lot of hard work to do. Some of the technology doesn't work perhaps quite as well as we first thought. Um, there's a lot of incompetence in the sector. There's a lot of scams in the sector. And all these things, uh, the curtain is gradually pulled back and we head into the trough of disillusionment. But then, if I may use some bad language, all the crap gets weeded out, ladies and gentlemen. Just the sensible, serious players remain. Um, the silly speculative money heads elsewhere, and the real hard work begins. The second generation products are built, um, mythology, methodologies and best practice improves, third gen products, and gradually we're on this slope of enlightenment and we head into the plateau of productivity. So just recall that pattern, that blue shape of that chart, and I'm going to show you now the NASDAQ. Here's the NASDAQ from 1998 to 2000. And you can see that dot-com went through that precise same journey. The innovation trigger in the early 1990s uh, through to the peak of inflated expectations in 2000 and all the madness that came with it. You know, the internet's going to change the world. The narrative was right, but there were stupid companies that made no money and boo.com and all the rest of them. You'll be familiar with some of the things that went on. And so we headed into the trough of despair, and it was in around about 2002, 2003, all the crap had gone bust, and only the serious players remained, and that's when the time to buy the Amazons, and Facebook hadn't even been invented, I don't think, at this point, the Amazons and the Googles and so on, that was the time to invest. And it wasn't until, I think, last year or even the year before that the Nasdaq reclaimed its old 2000 highs. So you can see the hype cycle play out in the NASDAQ. Now here's a chart of Bitcoin, and you can see once again it's gone through precisely that same cycle. And we're somewhere now in the trough of disillusionment. But I've actually played a little trick on you here, ladies and gentlemen. Can anyone see what that trick is? It's the wrong year. Well done. I'm glad somebody's concentrating. Uh, this is Bitcoin in 2013, 2014. And I remember writing about it in um, uh, 2015, going, we are at the bottom of the trough of disillusionment, now is the time, now is the time to buy. Bitcoin has gone through the hype cycle about three times in its evolution at least. Um, here's Bitcoin obviously today, and once again you see that hype cycle very clearly. Um, the big question is, has Bitcoin... When I say Bitcoin, I'm using that noun collectively. Crypto. Has crypto had its dot-com 2000 moment? Are we in 2002, 2003, or are we still way back in, you know, 1995 or somewhere like that? And I've got a little theory that I'd like to run by you. And that is, every decade, we seem to have a great bull market in some particular sector. In the 1970s, it was gold and gold shares. And gold went to $850, huge inflation. In the 1980s, it was Japan. And at one stage, I think, isn't there that statistic where the, the, the grounds where the Tokyo Palace is were, were worth more than the entire state of California? Um, similar insanity around Japan. Dot com in the 1990s, and of course, commodities uh, in the year 2000. And crypto is the bull market of this decade. Now here's the thing. In 1980, when gold went to $850, the value of all the gold in the world and all the gold mining shares and all the uh, exploration companies was equivalent to the market cap of the S&P 500. And the same thing happened in the 1980s with Japan. By the end of that decade, by uh, 1989, whenever the peak was, Japan was worth the same as the S&P 500. Same happened with tech stocks worldwide in the bubble of 2000. And the same happened with natural resource stocks by 2011. The market cap of the S&P 500 is 23 trillion, give or take. At the peak of the bubble 
crypto went to about 800 billion. It's a long way short of 23 trillion. And there are some market caps of some other comparables, uh, just FYI. Um, so that's a question. I don't quite know the answer to that question. I, don't, I still haven't decided. At the moment, it feels like we've had our dot-com moment. But there's a very real case. The weird thing that happened with most bull markets is that retail investors are the last people to get on board. When the shoeshine boy is giving you stock tips, that's the time to get out. The weird thing that's happened with crypto is it's worked the other way round. It was ordinary folk and tech-savvy tech people who got in first. It was the institutions who got in last. Um, but there's a very strong case to be made that crypto's dot-com moment is still to come. And we can expect a market cap of something like 23 trillion when that happens. And goodness knows where that pushes the price of altcoins. But I'll leave that for you to make up your minds. At the moment, sentiment is negative. So here's a map, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you now why the adoption of cryptocurrencies is going to eclipse fiat currencies. And that's because of this historic relationship between money and technology. And so here we are in ancient Mesopotamia, the first civilization. And nomadic folk came down from the Zagros Mountains on the right of your screen there, and they settled on the fertile plains between the Tigris and the Euphrates in what today is southern Iraq. Now, why did they settle? Why did nomadic, nomadic people settle? The reason they settled was because of the mud. The mud there found all sorts of different uses. They used it to make pots, to make tools, sickles, axes, hammers and nails. They found if you baked it with straw in the sun, it made bricks, and those bricks made the first homes which made cities. The fertility of that mud was the like of which no one had ever known. And suddenly, human beings were growing stuff. And as they grew stuff, they started producing more than they needed, than the, base, the, the bare essentials they needed to survive. And so we began to trade. And so the first form of money evolved, made from this very same mud. And the first form of money was not, as people think, gold. It was a security token. Little bits of mud, a cone representing uh, a measure of barley, two cones would be two measures of barley, a disc would be a sheep, two discs would be two sheep. These tokens were baked inside clay balls. And when the debt was settled, the clay, the clay ball was smashed open and the debt was settled. So you have the first example in those clay balls of an early blockchain, if you like, a, a record, a system of record. And then over time, merchants and traders found that rather than bake things inside these clay balls, it was quicker to just inscribe the clay with pictures of the money instead. And so we got the first um, system of writing, hieroglyphics, ancient hieroglyphs. And so there's this relationship between writing and, the, in fact, the early tax collectors were the scribes. So there's this historical relationship between money and technology. And here is the uh, modern equivalent of what was on that tablet in Sousa. And there's this relationship between technology and money has gone on and on and on. When ways were found to cast coins by which you could certify the amount of metal in a coin and stamp it with the uh, issuer, with the uh, head of the issuer. So we started using coins, whether it was copper, silver, um, nickel or gold. With the invention of the printing press, first in China, we like to claim the credit here in Europe for the invention of the printing press, but the Chinese were a good 500 years ahead of us in that regard. But the invention of the printing press, first in China and then in Europe, people stopped using gold as money. They used paper representing gold instead. With the evolution of digital technologies in the 80s and 90s, we started using digital money instead of cash and checks and paper. Now, 97% of the money that exists in the world only exists digitally. Just 3% of money exists as cash. And then we have this latest development, cryptography, this latest technological development. 
Until the mid-1990s, there was an important transition that took place in the mid-1990s, and this was the point at which investment in the intangible economy exceeded investment in the tangible economy. By the intangible economy, you know what I mean. I'm talking about things like software, design, trademarks, intellectual property, and so on. In 1990, the three biggest companies in Silicon Valley had a market cap of 36 billion, and they employed over a million people. Today, they employ about, the three biggest companies employ about a quarter of what they employed then, and yet their combined market cap is over 60 times higher. This is the intangible economy, ladies and gentlemen. The, the future is intangibles. It's not tangibles. And the problem that fiat currency has is that it is limited by borders. And even with currencies like the US dollar, which are internationally shared, they still lack scalability. You can upload a... If I, want, if I invent a fantastic car, the best new car ever been invented, and I want to sell it, I've still got to build a million versions of that car and ship them all out. Whereas if I build the best, a fantastic app, I, can, I need only upload it once, and it can be downloaded a billion times. If I have a fantastic algorithm, Google search engine, whatever it is, it can be downloaded millions of times. And so the reason that the intangible economy is eclipsing the tangible economy is scalability. And crypto is more scalable than fiat for the very reason that it is borderless. And not only that, even today, 2 billion in the global population of 7 billion is still unbanked. They don't have access to basic financial services. Yet by 2021, over 6 billion people in a global population of 7 billion will have a smartphone and they will have internet access. And that smartphone is the means by which they will first experience the internet in many cases. And as soon as they get their smartphone, they can get a wallet and they can have a, an address and they can start using crypto to accept payment for their goods and services. The, the scalability of numbers dwarfs the potential scalability of fiat currency. And that's why the combination of that and technology is why I'm convinced that crypto is the future. So I said this, this, this talk is the future of work, tax and money. I've done money, I'm going to do work and tax very quickly. Um, the employer... Income tax is the largest source of government revenue worldwide. It accounts for something like 50% of government revenue in the UK. Um, it relies on the traditional employer-employee relationship that emerged through the 19th and 20th century. That relationship is dying. We're all... How many people here are freelancers of some kind, have more than one job? Let's look round the room. That's well over half. Um, actually, maybe it's not. How many have one fixed employer? Uh, I think more freelancers, but you guys are the future because you're all in crypto. Um, I think the estimates are, um, in fact, I know the estimates are, it's Ernst & Young estimate that by 2030, 50% of workers will do contingent work of some kind, will be contingent. And... The nature of employment is changing. The, the global population in 2035 will be 9 billion, of which 6 billion will be workers. If half of that population are freelancers of some kind, that's half a population that are freelancers. Now, of those freelancers, it's estimated that a, a third will be digital nomads of some kind. They won't live in any fixed residence. Now, digital nomads are incredibly common in the crypto sector. Um, they're less common elsewhere, but this is the future of work. For example, if you um, grow up in London, it's very expensive to buy a house, um, but you can travel very cheaply. The internet is going to be very fast wherever you go in the world. You can earn a much lower salary and enjoy a much higher standard of living elsewhere in the world. Already, 50% of digital nomads operate in some way in the crypto economy. 
But if they're constantly moving, who do they pay tax to? Where do they pay tax? Um, you have, technically, if you're resident in a country for 183 days, in most cases, you would pay tax to that country where you're a resident. But many digital nomads are not fixed in any one place for 183 days. They're all going to base themselves where they pay as little tax as possible. They're being paid in cryptocurrency, in borderless currency. If you're a Bitcoin company, you've got employees all over the world in different places, it's inconvenient to pay them in different national currencies. It's easier to pay them in a borderless money. The internet is borderless. Money is becoming borderless. The intangible economy is becoming borderless. Workers will become borderless as well. That has grave implications for government revenue. They lose their income taxes. Governments are already struggling to tax the intangible economy. Look at the rows that go on with Google and Facebook and so on. We're going to see a world of tax competition where different countries have different tax rates in order to attract business. It's a race to the bottom. We'll see the rise, as they t attempt to place pressure on Google and Facebook and so on, we'll see the rise of DAOs, decentralised autonomous organisations. Um, how do you regulate these companies? Where are they based? We'll also see higher consumption taxes, ladies and gentlemen, because there, the tax man will always go where taxes are easiest to collect. And as national governments put their currencies on blockchains, tax collection will become more efficient because currencies will be harder, every transaction will be easier to monitor. But as governments struggle to maintain their services, their services as debts grow, you'll see an increasing aggressiveness from tax collectors in certain countries. And I wonder if we're going to see sort of two classes of people. One, people who are based, stuck in one abode, and others who are nomadic. A tax-free, sovereign individual. And at the same time as this, we're going to see more and more technology companies replacing government services. Already, public transport is being undermined by the likes of Uber. In central London, if there are two of you, it's already quicker to get an Uber over a short journey than it is for two of you to pay a tube fare. As we have driverless cars, the costs of transportation are going to go even lower. The internet is the most fantastic educational tool ever invented. My eldest child is now being home educated with a, with a tutor who we found on the internet over Skype using the internet. Cost me about a third of school fees and he's getting an education that's about three times as good. Even in things like healthcare, tech is playing a role. More and more people are using Fitbits, data monitoring, the early recognition of, of illnesses and so on. The nation state model by which the Western world lives, and it's a product of the Industrial Revolution, it's on its last legs. In many, ca in many cases, the nation states, as we now know them, will not exist uh, in, I don't know, 30 or 50 years' time. We're going to see many, many, much bigger proliferation of smaller city-states. And this is a consequence of this great technical revolution that we are living through, and we're all playing a part in. Hereby endeth the lesson. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.